right. Um, I'm going to get started. This is lecture 22 on uh, 1413 on happiness and uh, mental health. Okay, so what are we going to talk about uh, today? Happiness and subjective well-being, a little bit on mental health. Um, so we're going to talk about rationality and revealed preferences and what can we learn from choices and what does that tell us about happiness. Uh, uh, we also talk about some utility and how do we measure utility, um, in particular in terms of how do we measure happiness and is that a good or bad idea. Um, and then at the very end, we'll have a, a hopefully a llama or a goat visit, visit which will uh, at least improve my happiness, uh, hopefully yours too. I've had some tr uh, trouble uh, communicating by email with the llama, goat, uh, uh, and, and their sort of keepers. Um, uh, so I'm not exactly sure when they're going to show up. So they're scheduled. Um, the problem is like, so they have like only different certain time slots. The, the, the only time slot that was, that was available was at 2.30. So I asked them to show up earlier, um, uh, so 2.20 or, 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 or so. I hope uh, that's actually going to happen. Uh, but I haven't heard back, so I'm not exactly um, sure. So it might have to be like 2.30. I hope you don't have to, 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 to run. Uh, there was also some confusion about like which Zoom room the goat the llama should go into, and uh, hopefully they find our room, um, uh, even though they don't have an MIT ID. Uh, so anyway, that's that. Uh, and then on Monday, um, we're going to talk about policy with behavioral agents, which is very much sort of the, the idea that, well, now if people are potentially making mistakes or have uh, certain biases, and we might sort of think that we know about it, then perhaps we can do policies to improve their um, behaviors. And uh, in some cases, that's straightforward. If you sort of think, you know, people have uh, biased beliefs, so just have wrong information based on which they make information, then you might say, well, it's sort of just improve their information and then they make better choices. In other situations, it's much trickier because uh, A, you know, people might have certain preferences that are not stable over time. And so then it's very tricky to figure out what is even the objective function that we should maximize. Um, second, uh, it might be tricky because who knows what we know versus what people know. So uh, who knows that the government or anybody else knows actually better uh, what other, what's good for other people. And so in some sense, if you want to intervene, you better be reasonably confident that like what you're doing uh, uh, is actually well-founded and you know better um, what's good for people than they know themselves. And that gets, gets you in tricky situations because potentially if you sort of get wrong or, or people, if you sort of misunderstand people's preferences or their choices or behaviors, then you might intervene and make things be actually uh, because you just misunderstand what you like to do. Okay, so uh, you know, what is rationality in uh, our classical um, economics? How do we tell it's rational? So broadly, we think that beliefs, preferences, and actions are rational if they are uh, mutually um, consistent. What do we mean by that? Well, we mean by that that we see certain uh, behaviors, certain actions. We can measure um, people's beliefs in certain ways, and then we essentially can sort of find preferences that can rationalize these actions. Right? And so that's a very sort of odd definition. And sort of without that kind of definition, we can essentially say um, it's possible to be a rational cocaine addict. It's possible to rationally commit suicide. It's possible to rationally marry somebody who, who, who you met six hours ago. It's also possible to be a rational violent offender if there's certain preferences that people have. You can sort of write down some preferences that rationalize all of those things. And sort of back uh, uh, in mainstream economics, are very much a main um, uh, assumption. So the researcher's job is to identify this that are consistent with observed human behavior, right? So you see people being ways and the question is like what are preferences that um, rationalize um, that behavior now what's the idea we talked about this already before so actors make choices economists observe their choices and then to generate these choices uh, if um, actor were perfectly right right so the content to sort of give these imputed preferences normative meaning that's essentially if I know your preferences that is and that's what you should be uh, uh, doing. Isn't like if, if you prefer B, I should be helping you to, to do that, and that would be a good thing um, 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 for you. Now, just to give you an example of like what this sort of could let you potentially sort of astray, or like where you you might sort of argue, well, is that really sort of rational versus not? For example, uh, take Jack, who prefers taking cocaine uh, over quitting. 
Jack um, have lots of uh, speeches about wanting to quit, but in a way, as can actually act on it, that's just um, uh, cheap talk. Um, Jack might, in fact, if you were clean, but it getting clean is too costly because they're withdrawal costs. Um, um, Jack probably didn't have to be on an unhappy try cocaine, but this battle is sufficiently unlikely that his early experiments would have made sense. So finally, sort of cocaine should be legalized unless it generates externalities. That's essentially just people make choices. Um, they make, uh, uh, if Jack started taking it, it must have been that like he preferred uh, cocaine over not taking cocaine, even though there's a chance that he really addicted and will be miserable now. And now even if he uh, keeps taking cocaine and it's a quit, well, if he doesn't do it, well, then it must be a rational choice for him to, to uh, 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 not because it must be that the withdrawal costs are really high. Now, we talked a little bit about this uh, theory of rational uh, addiction, much about Becker and Murphy. We talked about already that, you know, uh, there's present bias or other factors involved, including bias beliefs. That might not be the case. But we sort of understand that like traditional economics until very recently would sort of say for the um, rational thing to do um, with Jack here, in fact, no good reason um, to, 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 to um, make uh, certain or any drugs illegal unlike externalities, right? So externalities would be like if Jack causes like behavior that's bad for others, um, um, then uh, we, we shouldn't let him do that um, because, you know, other people are harmed and you might not internalize um, the values. But unless that's the case, um, we should um, intervene in any way. Okay, but so now you might sort of say, but, 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 you know, what did we talk about in all of the thought? Like, how, how is that sort of consistent with what we talked about before? And that the key of that uh, question is the question of the people act in their best um, interest. And so um, what we sort of essentially assume often is that there's sort of a rational relationship between people's choices, what they actually do and sort of the hedonic consequences of those choices, which is sort of true well-being. And so what we assume is essentially that you make certain choices that maximize your well-being, essentially what you learned in like 1401 or 1403 is essentially utility maximization, and that's at the heart of like uh, sort of the rationality um, assumptions. So economists then tend to believe that most of the time people act at least approximately in their best interest. Um, now, um, as we talked about already, and this is sort of the uh, previous lecture about Nisbet and Wilson um, telling more than we can know, we should be actually quite skeptical about the fact that people actually know what they're doing and why they're doing it, because you know, uh, as I showed you last time, in some sense, people often seem to have like essentially no clue of why they do what they do. So it seems like a bit of an odd assumption to sort of say, well, people are um, um, maximizing what's best um, for them. So now, how can we check whether this assumption is appropriate? What would you do? So I'm, I'm telling you, here's certain behaviors. How can we actually check whether this assumption is an appropriate one? Uh, Lauren? We could check kind of like their well-being after um, they make these decisions and if they're better or worse off. Yeah, we have to sort of like somehow figure out some situations where we can track people's well-being. Um, ideally, we'd have sort of some sort of experiment. Uh, you know, there's group A and B, and group A wants to let them choose, and then in the other groups, we or maybe there's also group C. In some group, we essentially tell people oh, you should be doing A. Uh, doing one thing and another group we say we should be doing another thing and then there's another group where we ha have people essentially choose and then you can look at like track people's well-being and then we could sort of figure out is the group that gets to choose actually doing better than maybe some groups where we actually just tell them what to do. If in some ways or the, the, um, uh, the work by Daniel Rayleigh and others, if I can essentially manipulate you into making very drastically different choices by changing like small things that really arguably should be irrelevant for your choice, like for example, the social security number, like for example, uh, if I could manipulate you with like anchoring you with your social security number and then say, would you like to purchase this item for $10, yes or no, and that affects your choice, well then presumably that's a clue in some ways that like 
for that. You, you, something is not going right, and so you, you're you're not necessarily optimizing because precisely because the social security number really should be entirely irrelevant, arguably. In some forms of what we talked about, like preference reversal, or some form of like demand for commitment, or the like. If that's the case, it seems to be that then there's self-control problems involved or like bias beliefs in various ways that we all talked about, which sort of seems then to say, well, you keep saying you want one thing, you keep even like spending money on like say healthy eating, but then like you never, uh, the food all goes bad in your fridge and you keep eating like donuts. That seems to be something that's not quite, you just don't seem to be maximizing um, uh, uh, your utility. But in general, it would be great if you could measure behavior and then the hedonic consequences of those behaviors, people's well-being. And if you can then could say, like, well, option A or option B is better for people in general, or specifically when you ask them to choose, they can sort of figure out what's best um, for them. Notice that you need to know sort of the kind of factual here. You can't, like, if I see you doing one thing and then track your well-being, that doesn't, is not enough because uh, you know, I don't know the kind of factual whether you would be happy otherwise if you were not to choose that. Okay, so so um, the, great idea. Um, so now, how do we actually do that? So uh, it's useful to have some terminology here, um, uh, uh, but in particular, then the Kahneman um, and others have introduced it. And in Kahneman, remember this is from Tversky and Kahneman, uh, the Nobel Prize winner, um, who worked a lot on uh, uh, lots of version prospect theory that we talked about. They all, then Kahneman also has quite a bit of work on well-being and happiness and so on. So and he introduced this very useful uh, terminology, which is they call like uh, decision utility and experience utility. So now what's decision utility? So economists tend to use the word utility or utility function to describe the preferences that rationalize observed choices, right? That's essentially if you took 1401, 1403, et cetera, if people talk about the utility function, essentially it's the function that you write down that sort of maps your um, choices into well-being and the function that you maximize or by maximizing it, essentially say, well, given this utility function, um, uh, given your behavior, it must be sort of this utility function is that, or that utility function allows me to rationalize what you're doing. Uh, and then it allows me then sort of to explain where you choose apples over bananas. And um, so Kahneman calls these revealed preferences the decision utility. That's essentially the um, uh, preferences that rationalize decisions. When people make choices, uh, that's the utility that they perceive or that they think they will perceive uh, or, or receive um, uh, as a consequence of their choices. That's essentially, uh, you might call it like wanting or um, um, choosing. So uh, concretely for an addict, the decision utility of drug consumption exceeds the um, decision utility of quitting. So uh, if that person makes the decision of, of, of taking drugs, um, uh, it must be that uh, their decision utility is, is, is higher when making those choices. Um, uh, 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 they prefer one option over the other, which again, doesn't necessarily then mean that like afterwards the experience is actually better, but when making the choice of taking the drug, they think that's a better option um, for them. Now, uh, in contrast, Kahneman also talks about um, experience utility, which talks, of, which uh, sort of implies or talks about the hedonic consequences of choices. Uh, he calls these hedonic experiences uh, experience utility. That's essentially the, the the preferences that coincide with doing. So while you actually sort of experience the whole consequences of your choice, what experience um, uh, do you have, or what utility, or what's your well-being during that? That's actually going back a long time ago. If you look at sort of some of the boards in like economics of Bentham and others, sort of they thought that they talk a lot about pleasure and pain, which is very much about the experience people have in their life, as opposed to utility, which is the, again, the construct that you have uh, at the time of um, choices. Now, um, how do we measure sort of these hedonic experiences of well-being? Um, and then, so there's two questions, I guess. One is, how can we measure this? If I wanted to know what is your hedonic experiences of this lecture right now, uh, how would I do this? Uh, like, how do you enjoy, how much do you enjoy things? And then second, well, I can sort of measure your experience right now, maybe this moment, maybe this hour, but somehow I need to sort of aggregate this over time, right? I need to know, like you took class A versus class B, now I can measure you at different points in time, but somehow then I need to sort of aggregate this overall experience and how people are doing that is a separate question. So let's start with the first question, how do we measure people's um, well-being? If you wanted to like learn about your classmates' uh, experience in any type of situations, what would you do? What would you measure? 
One is you can ask them verbally, like, uh, how did you like activity A? Or how do you like B? Or like, you feel it like now, right? So just like asking what people want. So you could also just look at um, their facial features or the like um, and try to see how, uh, uh, how much they're smiling or, or, or the like. Notice that that you need to sort of map into some happiness as well, right? In some sense, I could be smiling but be deeply unhappy um, and if you would sort of misinterpret that. So you'd have to sort of have some function from the facial feature to sort of some underlying well-being that's somewhat grounded in some assumptions. It seems like reasonable to think that when people are smiling, they're happy and when they're crying, they're unhappy. But, but I'm just sort of pointing out that, that's, that that requires some underlying data to be able to map this. One is um, the sort of physiological measures such as heart rates, uh, uh, et cetera, or, and so there, um, again, I think some commonsensical stuff, like if your heart rate, if you're really afraid and like your heart rate goes up, presumably that's not a good thing, but if you're really excited and your heart rate goes up, um, uh, uh, presumably that's a good thing. So one has to sort of add some assumptions or some structure on sort of these measures and something's just sort of just measuring them by themselves. Uh, in general, it might sort of be misleading, but with some structure, surely one could sort of uh, uh, use that well. The other part is measuring, there's lots of neuroscience and other uh, uh, work on this, measuring people's brain and parts of the brain and seeing sort of which parts light up at which times um, uh, uh, could be another option. Of course, again, there you need to sort of map that into something else, right? So you need to then be able to say, suppose I do something nice for you, or which is something mean, I can then sort of figure out which parts of the brains are, are um, affected. And then I can sort of use that then to sort of later now, if I wanted to figure out whether, suppose I could measure your uh, brains during lecture, if I had figured out earlier which parts of the brain are associated with happy versus unhappy things, and now I could see like what your brains are doing during lecture, I could then figure out whether you're happy or unhappy. But notice you need to have some mapping um, uh, uh, because otherwise uh, it's hard to interpret um, what's going on, but of course people have um, already worked a lot on that, that, that kind of mapping. I mean, just to be clear, so the, the um, real preference measures are, um, uh, uh, let me show you what I have here, but the real preference measures are useful for some things, but in a way if you wanted to sort of measure whether the real preferences give you a good answer, then of course the real preference measure uh, 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 is not helpful or in, put differently like you kind of want to check precisely, like if I get you, suppose I ask you like, do you want lecture A or lecture B? Um, and then you, everybody says they want lecture A or like whatever, good A or good B, and everybody says they want good A. Uh, the econ assumption is by real preference, there must be that A makes you happier than B. But if I wanted to sort of to test, is that actually true? Then I need to have to reveal preference, but then I also need to know your kind of factual in some sense, once I give you good A and I give you good B, how that make you. And then I can sort of, so I need the measures that we here have here in the slides, a version of that sort of to say, okay, I'm gonna look at your facial expression and see how happy do you look when I give you good A versus good B, or I look at your brain and see which parts of it do the pleasure parts of your brain um, um, light up. And if that's the case, I'm gonna conclude that you're happier with good A versus good B, or that's, more so the case for good A. And then I can look at like your revealed preference. Is it really the case that like you choose A over B if the uh, sort of experience utility sort of says um, A makes you happier than B? Does that make sense? Okay, so what are the, uh, what are these uh, techniques that I think we covered most of? Them. There's the observer ratings, facial uh, 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 reports of mood, pain, pleasure, happiness, and so on. This is what Say that uh, 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 autonomic me measures, which you know, is uh, your respiratory, cellular, your blood pressure, or like your sorry, your, your pulse, and so on and so forth, sweat. Um, there's vocal measures as well, which is like pitch, loudness, tone, and you can probably detect whether somebody is angry or excited, and so on. And then, sort of again, you can sort of like some mapping here. You can uh, look at people's brains. Um, there's also some responses to emotion sensitive tasks. So if I ask you, you know, do you want to uh, talk to a friend? Um, or like, do you want us to do, do something nice? And if the answer is like, like no, absolutely not. You know, it could obviously be you're very busy, but like when people are in a bad mood, um, they tend to sort of not want to do things that arguably should make them uh, um, um, happy. Uh, okay, so we can sort of try to do that. Now, 
why might decision utility and experience utility differ? That's, of course, what we discussed in, in, uh, at length in the class, class already. Um, uh, there's sort of various uh, different um, explanations. One is, um, we're going to talk about this a little bit, which is inaccurate memories of past experiences. You might just misremember um, uh, your past experiences. And based on that, you might have like sort of poor forecasts of your future preferences or sort of your uh, uh, utility. So this is essentially saying like people's um, beliefs might be wrong in various ways, perhaps because people's memories are um, uh, tricking them in some ways. Um, people might also have like wrong beliefs because they're going to fail, that they have some failures to, to anticipate adaptation, which is very much like sort of projection bias that we talked about already previously. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more. Um, there could be things like emotions, which again is sort of in some ways often like um, projection bias, which is about like, uh, uh, you know, things like people might be really angry or people might be uh, um, as hungry and so well, essentially there, it's very hard for to make certain choices, um, failing to anticipate that their anger or their hunger or other sort of um, uh, uh, impulses way over time. Uh, there's sort of other, plenty of other reasons, but we talked about this um, um, quite a lot. And so you can think about a lot of what we discussed in the course about disconnects between decision utility and um, experience utility. Now, uh, it, I mentioned this already a little bit, um, sort of the, the, the uh, third part in, in people's utility is what um, Kahneman would call remembered utility, which essentially is to say, well, when you think about like uh, a past experience, um, you might not actually evaluate it correctly. In the sense you might sort of, as I said, you know, you, you, I, I might sort of, I, I might look at your experience utility using these kinds of features, and then I might ask you afterwards, how did you like certain experiences? And then I can sort of test uh, in a way, are you, how are you aggregating or how uh, appropriately are you aggregating uh, your experience utility when I just ask you afterwards, how would you, do you like certain um, uh, experiences? And one quite interesting feature is uh, in people's remembered utility is what's called, um, excuse me, uh, uh, duration neglect. People tend to remember the quality uh, rather than the length of the experience. And there seems to be also what's called the peak end rule which essentially uh, says that retrospective evaluations are um, very much predicted by two things, or an average of the peak effective response recorded during an uh, episode and the end value recorded just before the termination of the episode. And how do I think about this? Well, mostly uh, uh, I think about this as like being very salient. So when you think about and ask you about like a semester or like a certain lecture or a certain experience that you had, maybe a TV show or the like, when you think about it and try to remember how much you enjoyed that experience, well, what's most salient, of course, is like, is your latest experience, right? That's what comes to mind. Like the last thing you remember is like the last thing you experienced. And um, if the last episode of a TV show was terrible, um, that's what comes to mind, and you might say, well, the whole series was really bad, even though maybe previously it was quite good. And then what's, uh, the other thing, I guess, that seems to be really uh, important is sort of the, the peak, um, uh, both positive and negative. So if something was really, really great or really, really bad, people really, really remember that, as opposed to like um, stuff in between. And again, I think that's something that's just very salient in people's minds. And then sort of then thinking about uh, 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 these experiences, that's what comes to mind. And in studies that, so what, what are these studies doing? Well, there are these studies that, that tend to measure experience utility in certain ways, uh, either through um, just measuring people's, um, um, tracking people's sort of well-being uh, over time, and then sort of trying to predict uh, uh, their remembered utility. How did you like that experience? That's one version. Another version is, um, uh, let me show you uh, in one second, is um, where people do certain tasks specifically and they manipulate the experience deliberately. For example, uh, there are these tasks, which is called a, a cold presser task, which is they ask people to put their hands into cold water and then vary kind of the temperature or they vary uh, the duration. And then essentially you can, you can then try to predict um, people's remembered utility and then show things such as um, duration neglect or, or the like. And let me sort of uh, show you what that looks like. For example, um, this is a famous study by um, Schreiber and Kahneman, uh, 
they did um, a short trial, which is you put your hand into 14 degree water um, uh, uh, for 60 seconds, which is very cold, or a long trial where you put it into uh, water for um, 60 seconds and then the temperature rises to 15 um, degrees. I think this is, this is Celsius, not Fahrenheit, but anyway, it's cold. Um, uh, uh, but so the point here is that like putting your hand into 14, uh, uh, into for 60 seconds, into 14 degree water, and then another 30 seconds into 15 degree water, these are both unpleasant experiences. So if you did each of these things in separation, people would say, I'd into 60 seconds of uh, cold water. I also don't like uh, 30 seconds of uh, 15 degree water. These are both unpleasant experiences. Um, so neither of them are actually desirable. And sort of if you ask people, if you give people uh, this explanation, do you want to experience this again? People say, hell no, I really don't like this. And for both of these, like in separation. But once you put them together, the 30 seconds of 15 degree water is more pleasant um, than the 14 degree water. So when you do that, people sort of say they prefer the long trial over um, the short trial. And the reason being, and what they remember is like the last experience, which was not that painful, where things got better over time. So people's remembered utility is, is sort of violating any sort of like uh, uh, rules of like what would you really think in terms of nationality and, and, and in economics, which is precisely because they remember uh, the end um, rather than sort of the overall duration. So essentially the utility does not aggregate in the way we would think they uh, would because the experience at each point in time Negative. Um, there's different, there's uh, uh, unpleasant studies uh, for colonoscopy. Don't ask me about how they got ethical approval for those things. But anyway, uh, uh, studies for colonoscopy where um, getting um, extra um, um, uh, minutes uh, uh, where nothing bad happens. And essentially, the treatment group has better um, experience and memories of those kinds of, uh, uh, of the overall experience. Now that sounds kind of like you're torturing people, but in fact, if you think about it, well, if uh, in particular in medical procedures that are unpleasant, overall, if we can um, help people have better memories of those experiences, maybe they will be a lot likely to come back and get future treatments or the like. So in a way, you might sort of say, well, what are these studies? Why are people torturing people? Uh, why are researchers torturing people? Uh, uh, I, I agree with that notion. But in fact, if you think about it, if you wanted to design, um, if you think people are under um, using certain medical procedures or certain medical tests that they should be doing, you really think of dentists. If there's something that make people's overall memory or memory of their overall experience better by sort of having the end uh, of that experience slightly better than the uh, uh, than the previous part uh, that couldn't be helpful in uh, uh, generating sort of uh, behavior that's good for people in terms of getting their health even though of course the last minute of the actual experience would not be pleasant nobody wants to say like would you rather have like a, another minute of colonoscopy absolutely not but like maybe the overall experience if you remember uh, is in fact better than um, uh, if not. So there's other types of experience that shows this um, <laughs> duration like lack of peak and peak end uh, evaluations. People have shown like pleasant and unpleasant uh, uh, um, uh, uh, movies or contents of movies. Um, they have done these experiments with like uh, uh, with, with sounds or noise or various loudness and duration. There's also animal, um, aspects of that where essentially animals are are uh, uh, given unpleasant experiences, and then you look at like what what there's uh, different types of experiences where like the animal can go into like one direction or the other, or press some lever versus another, and then bad stuff happens in both of them. If one of them is worse than the other. And then we can look at essentially do animals of similarly uh, duration or other uh, uh, peak end evaluations of experiences. And it seems to be a very much like a, um, a phenomenon, phenomenon that's also true for, for, for animals. Any questions on, on this? So then, of course, if that's the case, if, people's, um, if people remember things differently, that will lead to um, 
that will lead to violations of the decision utility maximizing the experience utility. Right, if you think about the experience utility or like the overall experience, uh, the, the utility, overall ex experience utility of a certain uh, choice that you make, in this case, I guess the cold press or pass, think about this like sort of the integral over, like, say, in this case, I guess 90 seconds. In the first case, it's 60 seconds plus 30 seconds, uh, 60 seconds feeling bad versus 30 seconds of like putting your hand out, which is presumably like a neutral experience. If you're sort of integrating that, presumably um, uh, the short trial will give you like a higher valuation of like higher, better, uh, uh, more positive sort of experience overall, right? right? But then if you ask people, which one do you want? Because people remember the long trial as being less bad, uh, people might sort of choose um, the long trial over the, 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 the short trial overall. And so then that leads to essentially violations of the decision utility maximizing the experience utility because essentially people remember things uh, uh, in a biased uh, way. Okay, so then uh, uh, we talked about this very briefly. So, so far we talked about kind of uh, different ways of measuring. One specific thing that people have done um, a lot is just asking people simply about um, their happiness and life satisfaction. Um, so simply you ask people, there's different ways. Um, um, uh, there's sort of these types of ladder questions. How satisfied are you with your life as a whole, whole these days? Um, there's also like affect questions about like, did you experience certain emotions yesterday? Did you feel angry? Did you feel happy? Did you feel sad? And so on. The latter question um, is sort of a mixture of some people think of this as like life satisfaction. Some people interpret it as happiness. Others would sort of argue that it's rather about social comparisons. So the latter question has this notion, and I'm going to show you the definition in a second or in a bit. The latter definition is very much just like on a, 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 on a ladder from one to 10, how great could your life be? Um, where are you in this ladder? So it has very much sort of this flavor of some social comparison, which I, you know, is not quite ideal because it very uh, makes it like, well, on the ladder, like how far and low are you at the ladder? It makes it very salient that some people are higher or lower than others. So some of the responses that you see in those kinds of ladder questions are about sort of happiness, but they potentially are also about people comparing each other um, uh, to others in society and so on, which, which uh, um, might not be necessarily the same as like how happy are you uh, right now, it could be. Now, what's problematic about these happiness questions? What's like a, what, why are economists um, skeptical or, or what instances do we about? So just to be clear, so some people would argue like, we should have like a world happiness report and GDP. Uh, we should not maximize sort of GDP or like uh, look at like GDP growth as like an overall performance of society. Instead, we should measure subjective well-being, and that that's what we should essentially maximize. And policy should be the objective should be to to to, to maximize that. So, what's the pushback on that? So, so part of that is people, the stuff that we talked already about about um, you know. Uh, uh, remember utility or people just might not know what's what's good for them but what's wrong with just asking people how happy are you and like are people like just going to tell you or like what's the problem with that yeah so one problem broadly speaking is um when you look at different countries different societies particularly for example if you look at germans germans tend to be pretty grumpy and not super uh, uh happy so when you ask a german how are you doing the typical german would sort of say okay by which they mean actually pretty good. If you talk, ask a, a typical American, how are you doing? They say amazing, they probably mean like pretty good. Um, so uh, when people give you certain statements, there's lots of cultural and other sort of aspect that make comparison, particularly across societies kind of tricky. Like you might think like people in Latin America tend to report higher levels of happiness because that's sort of a cultural thing, which might be that they're actually happier. It might be that that's just a thing that you're supposed to um, uh, exhibit. While people in uh, some other states, uh, Scandinavia, Germany, et cetera, might sort of be in fact quite happy, but like what they report to you is just some moderate uh, uh, level of enthusiasm uh, overall. So one is sort of cultural uh, comparison is quite hard um, uh, uh, using those types of questions. There's lots of Gallup uh, surveys that people have done uh, at large scales, it's like the Gallup World 
happiness or whatever surveys, there's like huge um, amounts of data that are being collected. They're nationally representative surveys and so on and so forth. So that those data are available. Of course, there's questions in like, you know, uh, in some places it's much harder to collect these than in others and so on and so forth. And, you know, some people don't reply to surveys and so on and so forth. For example, the elderly might be much less likely to, to answer certain surveys or like some people without phones or internet and so on and so forth, you might not be able to reach them. But in principle, you can solve all of those issues. But I think that's, it just costs it to do so. That's the reference dependence is a very interesting issue because in some ways you might say, well, now your income, but then your reference point goes up, nothing happens to your reported happiness, but presumably you're happier than before. So that in some way. On the other hand, um, utility might in fact be very much reference dependent. For example, um, you might compare your to yours and then inequality, for example, might be extremely important for people's happiness. And sort of one of the things that people argue is that, for example, why not, uh, people, the GDP also including in the US, GDP in many places has gone up quite a bit, but happiness has not increased. But often that's, uh, people argue that's because in part, uh, inequality also went up a lot. And if then inequality really makes people deeply unhappy, well, that is important and we should, we should incorporate that in some ways in our considerations overall. But you see that causes tricky issues because in, in, in one case, I'm doubling everybody's income and presumably people should be happier because their living standard goes up. Um, so presumably there, we sh even if happiness doesn't go up, presumably those living standards have gone up and something is going wrong if, if I don't see increased happiness in terms of measurement. On the other hand, there might be very much real issues about inequality is quite important and reference dependent matters for people's happiness and well-being in the sense that like what really might matter a lot is relative income rather than absolute income and we should capture that in some uh, meaningful way. Um, uh, oops, sorry. Um, in particular, there's lots of issues with like depending on what I focus you on when I ask certain questions, I can get very, very different answers. And one, for example, uh, example of this is uh, there's a paper by Strzok et al. that looked at the correlation between general happiness and happiness with dating. And so what they did is a very simple thing. They essentially just manipulated the order of questions. So first they asked people about how happy are you in general. Um, and then they asked people how happy are you with your dating life. And in a different subsample, they asked people how happy are you with your dating life and then asked people about the general happiness. And what that does essentially it focuses people very much about dating as part of, sort of their life being important and for their happiness. And similarly, I think this is exactly what Maya was saying as well. We just ask you about the lateral question versus about sort of other questions about, uh, depending on how I phrase the question, I can get very different answers um, uh, in what you're saying. And so that makes it very tricky to figure out like which question should we use, how much weight should we put on it. And even like things like the order of questions matter, matters quite a bit, which makes economists very um, nervous and so on. And that that's why in part economists would argue that we really should have a real preference and choice. Now, on the other hand, um, I very much think the questions when you just ask people and say, I'm deeply unhappy, that has some content and sort of there's, there's information there. And sort of then the question is, well, how do, we, how, do we, how do we weigh these considerations? On the one hand, the survey instrument, this is really just very fragile and we don't measure very much. On the other hand, um, uh, there's useful information here that we should be incorporating um, somehow. So I just wanted to sort of have you that caveat in mind. And so let's now look at some um, data that people have collected. So what's a very nice uh, source uh, overall is what's called the um, uh, Our World in Data, which uh, uh, has lots of interesting uh, graphs and figures where you can look at happiness and all sorts of things, uh, uh, data in the world. And when you look at life satisfaction around the, the, the globe, this is very much the uh, latter question here, which you see exactly uh, uh, as it was saying, there's sort of the, the, the ladder from zero to 10, and again, the latter question is very much something hierarchical and makes, it, makes inequality or relative comparisons quite salient. Even if it only asks you about like your worst or best possible life for yourself, it does have the, the, the feeling that really it's about comparing yourself to others. But anyway, that's very much used in many uh, cases. Often people call it life satisfaction, but even here they also call it like happiness um, overall. This is from the World Happiness um, Report. And what you see is that in general, rich countries tend to be uh, report higher happiness. Scandinavian countries in particular, the US is like reasonably happy. Europe is quite happy. Um, and then if you go to like poorer countries, in particular in Africa, um, uh, they tend to be uh, report a lot lower um, happiness level. 
Um, when you look at comparisons across countries, you see like a very clear um, uh, relationship. Rich countries um, tend to be a lot, report much higher um, uh, life satisfaction uh, compared to poor countries. That's a very clear association. That's true both across countries, but also true um, within countries. So what this graph here shows you is the average income in a country. And then these arrows show you the gradient within the slope of the arrows is the gradient within countries. And what you see is essentially, uh, so this is like comparing people within countries, rich versus poor countries. Uh, what is the huge sort of increase uh, uh, income within a country by like a thousand or something dollars? How much does uh, uh, people's um, happiness go up? And what you see is all of those countries have like, uh, almost all countries have like increasing gradients, which tells you that both within and across countries, richer uh, people report higher um, life satisfactions compared to poorer people. Um, similarly, um, that's also true for mental health. So these are all questions about subjective well-being, how happy are you overall, asking the overall population. But if you try to look at mental health um, conditions in terms of particularly um, depression and anxiety, so techniques so, so, uh, uh, using uh, um, clear definitions on uh, psychiatric disorders uh, for depression and anxiety and for also for other conditions, you find that the poor in any given location are more likely to suffer from depression and or uh, anxiety. Interestingly, the prevalence of depression uh, um, uh, and in fact also and anxiety is higher in rich countries. Um, there's some, there's a lot of questions about measurement problems and like is are we really measuring the same thing and, and, and so on and so forth. But it could also be there's other factors involved and particular issues such as inequality. Um, and it could just be that really what's really important is, is relative income as opposed to, to absolute income. Now, um, we know also that anti-poverty programs uh, uh, improve mental health in various ways. Uh, so including things like um, um, uh, cash transfers and um, uh, uh, other anti-poverty programs. So this is an overview of studies. This is essentially a recent uh, meta-analysis that we did for some overview paper uh, uh, of mine. And what you see here is a number of different interventions, uh, both cash transfers and other anti-poverty programs, which sort of are more broader programs. And what you see here is the treatment effect estimated in the different studies. These are um, uh, overall poverty, anti-poverty programs. These are cash transfer programs. It overall, essentially, the overwhelming um, answer is that once you give people cash or reduce their poverty, that improves their mental health as measured by different, uh, these are P PWB, means psychological well-being indices. This is also like depression screening scores and so on. So by various measures of people's mental health, giving people more money uh, improves their mental health. So that's true at the extreme in terms of like uh, really sort of mental illness, uh, uh, depressive um, and anxiety disorders. It's also true for other measures of psychological well-being. If you just give people cash, they report higher happiness. In addition to what I told you before, this being true in the cross um, section. Now, interestingly, uh, we also tend to think that others are less happy than they say they are. So if you just ask people um, how happy are other people in your country, in almost every country in the world, what you find is that people tend to say the fraction that people actually say that they're very happy or rather happy is, is uh, uh, lower than uh, they actually say they are, which is kind of an interesting um, uh, 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 fact. Now, um, this is, we talked about this already a little bit, how is life satisfaction and happiness related to life events? It turns out when you look at different life events, and that's quite interesting that a lot of life events tend to affect people's um, uh, reported um, uh, well-being or life satisfaction a lot. For many events, including stuff like widowhood or divorce or marriage and, and other sort of types of events or winning the lottery, these effects are very much transitory, which is to say like when, when somebody, when something really bad to somebody happens, their happiness goes down a lot, but it tends to recover um, quite a bit. This is what we talked about before. People are quite adaptive to many changes and they adjust quite well. This is what people call the psychological immune system, um, except for a few things, including unemployment. And one potential reason is that, for example, unemployment might also call, cause things like depression. And once you're really depressed, that doesn't really go back or revert um, that easily. That's true for women. It's also true for um, um, men overall. There's also some other issues which you want to be careful with in interpreting some of this data, which is 
this is called like this evolution of um, latent situations, which is when you look at um, things like divorce, uh, it tends to be that people, when you get um, people's divorce, you might sort of say, well, divorce makes them happier in some ways, but really what seems to be, or uh, that, that, or you would look at this and say marriage makes people less happy, but really what seems to be the case is that, you know, people build up to like a, a positive event and then that sort of peaks uh, positive or negatively, and then essentially go back, goes back to, to, to what's before. For example, unemployment, t things tend to go worse even before people become unemployed. Um, um, uh, uh, so, which seems to say there's people tend to these underlying events, people tend to anticipate them already um, psychologically in some ways. Now, um, this is what I was saying before. When you look at uh, comparisons over time, um, you get sometimes these situations where, in particular, in uh, places including in China, but also in the US, where real income has risen um, a lot in many places, but yet um, people's life satisfaction does not tend to increase. Why is that? Well, that's in part, I think, because of inequality going up and sort of, or inequality is staying the same and relative income really being important. Could be other things going on. For example, pollution is really bad for people's health, uh, mental health, but also their happiness and so on. It could also just be that people's uh, reference points adjust, which is just you make everybody twice as happy and now everybody's the reference point goes up, even though their overall sort of objective well being standards in terms of like how much can be consumed, et cetera, has gone up um, a lot. Now, um, this is quite interesting data now on uh, ceiling effects. So people, uh, so there's some controversy over this. There was like some people were arguing that when you give people more money, at some point there's a ceiling effect. Uh, it doesn't really make them happier anymore. Now, um, when you look at this graph here, let me go back for a second. When you look at um, these graphs here, this, oops, sorry. So this lag. When you look at this graph here, it just doesn't look at all like ceiling effects. It looks like essentially self-reported uh, uh, life satisfaction as measured by these kinds of um, ladder question, uh, essentially is like increasing and there seems to be no um, ceiling or doesn't seem to be flattening in any way. When you look at this one as well, it seems to be like once you, if you increase income by like $1,000, uh, at any level, it seems to be that like reported life satisfaction goes up. So again, that doesn't look like there's ceiling effects. And that's true um, as well. If you look at um, these questions here, this is uh, Gallup had done these surveys in the US. When you look at the latter question, which is this one here, when you look at annual income in the US, once you increase people's income, their um, mean ladder score, which is here on the, on the axis on the right, tends to go up pretty much like monotonically. Maybe it's a little bit flattening, but essentially it goes up. So people report higher life satisfaction when they have higher income. But when you look at people's affect, both things like positive affect, which is like happiness, smiling, enjoyment, not being blue, being stress-free, and so on, what you see is, in particular, this is for the US, uh, when you go from like something like $10,000 to $20,000 to $40,000 per uh, year of income, uh, there's a clear increase over time. So being poor is really like poor, like, um, you know, uh, uh, in the US, it is really, really bad for your um, affect and for your sort of uh, reported um, well-being overall. But um, once you reach something like 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars in the US, it seems to be that there's not no, no effect on positive effect, feeling blue, stress-free, and so on. So one interpretation of that is that if we take these affect questions as more like a measure of experience, utility, and happiness in any given life, Essentially, having something like seventy, eighty thousand dollars per year in the U.S. This is uh, granted. This is like from two thousand nine, so maybe this number is not a little bit higher. Uh, but that number uh, is sufficient to make people sufficiently happy. And beyond that, um, doubling your income will not do very much on like how much you smile every day and how happy you are as a measure of those things. In contrast, if I ask you the latter question, which again is very much about comparison, about how you feel you yourself compared to, to somebody else in society. Uh, going from 100,000 to 200,000 will, um, will make potentially um, uh, still quite a big difference. Um, any questions on, on, on that? So then let me, uh, uh, and this is among, among the most interesting um, uh, um, parts of this kinds of, uh, these kinds of studies is the question about what in fact, so if not just income, so we know income essentially overall, if you're rich, you're gonna be happier compared to if you're poor. 
But again, um, uh, it seems to be like really, if you want to sort of not be uh, unhappy, having income above fifty thousand dollars in the U.S. is really important. Beyond that, it doesn't seem to do very much um, anymore. But now, what other things matter quite a bit? And this is a very simple exercise. So what they did is, um, this is um, that he was supposed to read. Um, they looked at the Gallup survey questions from 450,000 Americans. And what they did is, for each of these four measures of, of um, psychological well-being, which is, you know, these here, positive affect, not blue, stress-free, and the latter questions, um, they were first just trying to predict uh, what is the regression coefficient of high income? So if you just split the sample in two and look at high income versus low income, uh, what is the regression coefficients of that? They kind of sort of uh, interpret that as causal effects, which of course is, is, um, uh, is a little uh, uh, problematic. But you can think of this as the question, if you wanted to try to predict how happy you are, what do I need to know about you? What are the, what, what are the factors that I need to know about you if I wanted to predict how happy you are in your life on any given point in time? If you wanted to know in 20 years from now, are you gonna be happy or not? What are the things that uh, you need to know about yourself? And so uh, it turns out that high income is predictive for this coefficient um, that says if you have higher income, you're somewhat more likely to have positive affect less likely to, to, to feel blue, less likely to be stressed, and a lot more likely to uh, answer a higher, uh, give a higher answer in the latter question. So in some sense, higher income is good. And then what the table does is it looks at, it normalizes high income to one, and then shows you other characteristics and says, okay, um, if I knew another characteristic about, about you, are you religious versus not, uh, and so on, what is the relative uh, coefficient of that compared to high versus low income, okay? So for example, if you're old, you're um, uh, sort of positive coefficient means like you're, you're, you're happier or more likely to have positive affect here and a negative the opposite, um, I guess, for, for positive affect here. So if you're old, for example, older people, at least in the US, tend to report higher um, uh, positive affect. So that's good news for you. In 20, 30 years, you'll be likely to be, to be happier. Um, it turns out that religious people, for example, tend to be um, more, uh, more uh, uh, report more positive affects compared to non-religious people. Uh, and, and the magnitude of these effects is pretty large. That is to say, 1.16 is sort of to say, uh, if you compare religious, if I knew about you, are you religious versus not, that is as predictive as knowing about you, are you rich versus not, are you in the upper or lower half of this income distribution. So that's quite important in terms of like trying to predict whether people are happy. Now, what's particularly striking here is, uh, uh, when you look at this here, is alone, uh, uh, smoker, uh, and headache in particular. Um, I, I want to sort of emphasize the alone here, sort of social relationships or people um, being in relationships with friends or in family or uh, with partners is extremely predictive of people's um, well-being. This is what I was talking about before when it came to social preferences sort of investing in social relationships seems in one way is a way of, of course, making other people happy and being nice is good, but in a way about uh, investing or, or being nice to others uh, uh, and investing in social relationship is very much an investment in your um, future um, 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 well-being. And the magnitudes here are like sort of uh, uh, enormous. Now, another way you could do is, uh, uh, so, here you could say, well, what should I do to make me happier um, in the future? So one thing you could do is just look at data. So one thing you could do is look at data and say, well, what is it? What are these predictors of people happy? These are all correlations. You want to be careful. It sort of tells you something about like if you want to be happy in 20 years, things you want to invest in, these numbers are probably like a pretty good um, uh, um, uh, start. For your health seems to be like quite a good idea smoking, for example, um, um, not so much. Now, another thing you could do is ask people um, at the end of and just uh, what they say um, about what they uh, should have or could have done in their life. What do you think people said? So this is an Australian nurse who recorded experience from Palliar um, as uh, end of life experiences and asked people about like, uh, or she didn't necessarily ask, but she was just recording what people are saying. What are the top five um, regrets? What, what would you think they are? Not spending enough time with family. 
-hmm. Wish to have worked less, Manuel says. Good enough. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, so essentially what people tend to say is um, a, a combination of like, they wish they had done been more social, they had been, uh, wish they had expressed their feelings more, they had been more uh, true to themselves in some ways and sort of not done things that others wanted them to do, but rather um, uh, 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 spent more time with their friends and family and so on. Now you want to be a little bit careful with this. This is again, sort of there's issues with remembered utility. It's also issues with like, if you are um, alone at the end of your life, you might be quite um, unhappy because of that. Be careful um, uh, uh, how to do that. But I think we can actually learn quite a bit about this. So in some ways, if you think about sort of certain choices you make in life, um, understanding kind of um, some of these issues seem to be quite important um, uh, overall. And think about like, what should you maximize? It seems to be that maximizing sort of income, uh, if that comes at the, uh, uh, at the cost of like, not having friends seems to be like not a good idea um, if you want to be happy um, uh, in the long run. Another thing that people, by the way, here, this is not in here, tend to, 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 to uh, emphasize quite a lot is um, having a meaningful job or having work that they believe in in terms of uh, something meaningful as opposed to maximizing um, income, which, you know, um, uh, seems quite important. Okay, so then um, what kinds of things then could you do to, to make yourself happier? And I have a few things um, uh, written down here. So one thing that I already said is invest in and maintain social relationships. Um, and small acts can make big differences, um, as we um, uh, talked about, of letters of gratitude, or random acts of kindness. These are very small things um, that you could do. Of course, you could do also like uh, a really, uh, and really important things that matters quite a lot, how much you help your friends or how much you sort of invest in, um, uh, in others. Again, that's partially reflective of just being pro-social and being nice to others, but you can think of this as very much as like, and ironically in some ways, you can think of this also as like investing in your own happiness in the future. Uh, choosing meaningful work over money seems really important. Um, um, I'm, uh, um, if you think about what to do with your life, there's so much talent at MIT, and I, um, I sometimes wish you know, that talent would go more into more meaningful things, both because of uh, society or like making society better overall, as opposed to like uh, uh, um, some perhaps potentially social ways that pay you a lot of money. Um, that's in some sense sort of um, potentially socially optimal in terms of use MIT's talents or MIT students' talents for useful things in the world. But uh, if you're just selfish and want to make yourself happy in 20 years from now, it seems to be that just maximizing income is just not what's going to get you there. So it seems to be like, like being rich is really uh, uh, glamorous and exciting. But in fact, if that comes at the cost of your health, your mental health, um, um, uh, and your friendships, most likely or happy or at the cost of having a meaningful job that you actually believe in and I think is useful, that's not going to make you happy in the long run. So for those of you thinking about what kind of work to pursue in the future, uh, 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 keep that in mind. Uh, and then uh, I have two more things uh, here on my list, which is seek support to improve your mental health and reduce social media um, usage. So what do I mean by that? So psychotherapies have very much been shown uh, to be effective in reducing depression, anxiety, and so on, yet people tend to not make use of those services. Now, why is that? Uh, there's sort of obvious reasons, which is stigma, shame, and so on. There's also potentially misperceptions, projection bias, also like depression itself, for example, could precisely generate these kinds of beliefs. Uh, there could also be other behavioral biases like other health conditions, you know, people just don't like to see doctors and so on. Now, another way to view this is to say, well, you might sort of think that psychotherapy is really important for depression and anxiety, but psychotherapy could also be viewed as like sort of a coach to make you happy. And think about this as like a happiness coach. It might help you figure out your objective function in life, what really makes you happy and how to pursue that. And that's sort of regardless of depression, anxiety, or any mental disorders, that's to say like, Think about like sports. In sports, like you get a coach to be a better tennis player or whatever, or like soccer or whatever you sports you do, that's a very natural thing to do. People help you to do better. Now, why not have a coach for many other things in life, including like how to be happier and how to lead a life that sort of makes you, uh, 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 satisfies you. And I think that's in some sense, if you are maximizing your wrong objective function, which again could be like you just maximize money over sort of other things, if the therapist help you do that or help you sort of correct that, that could be extremely valuable um, and helpful. Um, uh, and again, that's sort of in the absence of any sort of uh, uh, serious mental illnesses, that's just for like the average person having somebody to talk to to help you optimize your life 
uh, and sort of your, your mental well-being seems to be extremely important um, uh, and worth trying. Um, second, about uh, social media. So uh, there's a, a recent paper uh, that's quite intriguing. There's actually a couple papers, but let me just mention one, which is by Al Fodadal, um, that um, randomly uh, randomizes paying students to stay off Facebook for a month. This was before the 2018 election, which an election, uh, which is in some sense perhaps relevant uh, in some ways. Like the timing might matter um, uh, for some of these results. And so what they find is that sort of getting people to, A, you have to pay students quite a lot to do this. So students, you have to pay them like $50, and otherwise, you know, they're not willing to do this. When you do that, people reduce their online activities. Um, they also you reduce their factual uh, news knowledge, political polarization, and so on, all kinds of things that you might expect. Then you see um, increased subjective well-being, both happiness, but also like reduced depression. So students are um, happier, uh, uh, quite a bit happier by um, uh, doing that. Moreover, there seem to be large persistent uh, uh, reductions in post-experiment um, Facebook usage. That is to say, once the experiment is over, lots of students who have been paid to stay on Facebook uh, uh, tend to do that, or to, to continue doing that, which very much sort of seems to say that uh, it's a habit good. Perhaps there's also some learning involved, as in like students learn that um, uh, they're now happier uh, uh, overall. Now, that obviously leads to the question, well, why are people then on Facebook if it doesn't make them, them happy? And does it have to do with like peer pressure? Does it have to do with like habit formation? Does it have to do with like um, self-control problems? Does it have to do with bias beliefs and so on? But overall, in some ways, I think the, the reason why I showed this evidence is like uh, when you think about your life or things that you do in your life, you kind of want to think about like wh what are the things that you do in your life? What are the things that make you happy uh, or, or not? And perhaps experimenting with those kinds of things or just looking at data from studies um, seems to be like a very reasonable thing to do. So it could well be that social media makes you really happy and connecting with your friends. In particular, right now, that's really a thing that's really helpful because you know you can stay in touch and you can like talk online and so on and so forth. And that's really like a thing that's worth worth doing. So that could really be very beneficial for your um, uh, happiness overall. But it might also be that uh, there's large uh, costs in that coming from perhaps like social comparison or like just seeing everybody happy on Facebook or whatever people post selectively makes uh, it look like people are, are uh, way happier than they actually are. And then that makes people feel bad about themselves seeing others sort of post overall. But I think uh, what I, the reason why I show this is I want you to think about or be more conscious about uh, what are the things that do make you in fact happier and try to sort of invest in those that uh, uh, seem to make you happier overall. So some of these things you could obviously experiment with. For example, you can obviously turn off your Facebook or Instagram, whatever, um, uh, very quickly and easily. Other things, of course, the stuff that I showed you um, in the very long run, um, like you know the, uh, the the Kahneman data here. These kinds of data, of course, uh, it's much harder to experiment with that. Like it's harder to say I'm going to be religious for a month from, uh, uh, from now on, and then sort of see how you're happier. Um, uh, but it is worth to think about kind of what are the things that you're really pursuing. And are these things going to be making you happy? Not just right now, and is this just because you're doing some things because your friends want it or like some other influence that you have, as opposed to like, what are the things that you really want and what are the things that are gonna make you happy? Not just like uh, this month or next month, but like five, 10, 20 years um, from now, because a lot of choices that you make uh, uh, in the next couple or three years uh, will be very persistent in terms of like, depending on what jobs you choose, what kinds of um, uh, friendships you have, what kind of partners you have and so on, will be very much persistent for a long time in terms of determining um, your long run happiness. And so that's a very useful thing to um, think about. Um, let me see. So what, what do people think? Um, um, and I guess um, at some point, hopefully, uh, so Pierre-Luc is monitoring the Lama situation, I hope. Um, uh, 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 we'll see about that goes. Hopefully that makes people happier. But um, what, what do people think is, why, why are people on Facebook if it doesn't make them happy? So there could be essentially issues with uh, present bias or the like, that like any point in time, it's, it's kind of there's some temptations of perhaps posting or the like, and then, you know, uh, 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 that makes you happy in the very short run, but in the long run overall, then that's not really um, helping you uh, overall. And there's some, so essentially some self-control problems in some, some, some ways. Um, in particular right now, and so to be clear, the study that was done here, and I actually talked to Hunt Alcott, who's one of the authors of the study, 
would also tell me like, look, uh, uh, if you did the study right now, maybe you would find the opposite because you know, now, in fact, Facebook or any other social media helps people stay in touch and there's some positive benefits. And so what you're saying is, uh, well, presumably Facebook was uh, you know, uh, um, developed early on or the reason why it was successful because it really helped people connect to each other in some ways and people thought there were some benefits from that and that's particularly true if you're sort of not at the same place uh, uh, physically and sort of particularly right now, then uh, there are these benefits overall. Um, and then there's a question of, well, what are the costs and benefits of that? And, you know, maybe people misperceive some of these or, or, or the like. What I'm trying to encourage you is to sort of say, well, uh, there's ways to learn about this. And Facebook is actually a very good example uh, where you can learn very easily, where you can say, let's turn it off for a month and see what happens. You could also, and there's some other activities where you say, let's do more sport. So let's get up early in the morning or sleep more at night. There's some things where like that are quite easy to experiment with. Other stuff, as I said, you know, becoming religious versus not is much trickier to, to experiment with or like being healthy versus not. In some sense, it's just a very much long run uh, uh, effect. Um, but exactly, as you said, people have met, never actually experienced any of this. So how would you know um, how you're gonna be happier? There's also some, uh, you know, uh, public goods issues or some issues of um, externalities as a more If all of you are on social media and you are not, you're kind of a bit of an a, a outsider and uh, that sort of will make you likely very, um, or likely not increase your happiness. But it might well be that like if everybody decides to um, uh, go off social media, then everybody, did, sometimes then you don't rely on social media to like go to parties or whatever and so on. And so there might be also sort of coordination issues potentially. So conditional on everybody being on Facebook around you, you might want to be on Facebook or whatever other social media. Well, if that's not the case, then uh, so it could be for every single person, every single person could be happier if everybody else um, were not on social media, but conditional on that everybody is on social media, um, uh, that's not the case. And sort of, uh, but what I'm saying here is we tend to do the same things over and over again, as Maya was saying, is what, but why don't we just experiment more? Um, often there's immediate costs, but perhaps like long run um, benefits. There's default effects, of, of course, and so on that keep us from experimenting. But if you think about it, if you could make yourself just a little bit happier every day for like many, many years, it seems to be worth experimenting a lot. So I would sort of very much uh, encourage you to go and try out new things in life that, that potentially make you happier. Um, Assemble a little bit enough and has a nice, uh, uh, I hope this is still working the link, but has a very nice New York Times article that argues that what do we do? Um, um, experiment more and try to figure out what makes us um, happier. Uh, any other thoughts on, on social media or Facebook? Okay, so uh, that's all I have for 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 now. Um, uh, next time we're going to talk about um, policy. That's the last lecture. Please do read um, um, uh, uh, Thaler and Sunstein. Philip tells me the Lama is not not here yet. Neither in sort of uh, uh, the the, the uh, my private room where I. The Lama might be otherwise. Uh, I'll give you this wait. I think the the announced time is like two thirty, so that's in four minutes. So if you have to run, of course, that's fine. Otherwise, I'm just going to uh, stick around and wait. If you want to talk about more, I'd love to sort of know more about why people are um, experimenting more. I also would love to more, know more about um, how people think. So, so one thing I was mentioning here is that well, social media might be bad or there might be detrimental effects, in particular coming from social comparisons, which is to say, look, uh, you see everybody on Instagram looks like they have a glamour, glamorous life and are happy all the time. And you see that, and that might make you feel depressed. By the way, that might also lead you to sort of glamorous pictures yourself. So it might reinforce the whole issue overall. And there, there surely are some downsides, actually. But there's also potential upsides of connecting people online. Um, uh, a project that I'm trying to, to work on. And I think so. Your poster, if anybody has some things one could do right now um, online to help people uh, be more connected and less lonely and more depressed and less depressed. 